So when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is released. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church. The message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. Ah, let's see. Those of you who are remaining in the room, you can open up your Bibles to the book of Acts or your devices to the book of Acts. Obviously, I'll be projecting my translation of the Greek language that is uh, this section of Acts is written in. And so it's always good to have your own translation open in front of you for that so you can take notes and look at differences in the way that things are translated. We are looking at the ending of the first missionary journey. Now remember, this is an epoch-changing event that is happening. As we're looking at the Apostle Paul, starting in Acts chapter 13, um, as, as we see the story of him and Barnabas being set aside to go out on that first relatively short missionary journey, relatively short in the sense of miles, compared to when he actually goes out to Macedonia and Greece and, and all of that further. Um, but that first launch took over a year. He was, he was on this missionary journey, he and Barnabas, for over a year, but it was still relatively short. When they left Antioch, from that point on in Acts chapter 13, the book of Acts is about Saul, who became known as the Apostle Paul. And it's because of the fact that the world was changing. God's administration in the world was changing. Um, in, in God's uh, economy, as he was working with the church now, the mystery that was being revealed is that he was working through the church and that he was, his whole goal was to create one new man out of Jew and Gentile together. And that still hasn't been fully realized by any stretch of the imagination, but he is certainly working that agenda. And I believe it's what he's really involved in doing as we step into what is known as the, the fullness of the kingdom age, which is coming. And so we'll be looking at all of that. But that change is why Luke just takes the camera angle and focuses right on Paul and then follows him as he goes to Cyprus, as he goes north to Asia Minor, as he stops in the, the, uh, the areas that he was preaching, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, um, then Lystra, Derby, and uh, those areas down there. Uh, so the, the areas that are being focused on as Paul goes around with Barnabas and does his work. Now, last week we saw that when he was in Lystra, there was an amazing miracle. It kind of sh uh, paralleled. Uh, when Peter and John were going into the temple to the gate beautiful, and there was a guy that was lame from birth there, and Peter reached down and grabbed his hand and pulled him up, and there was an amazing response of God's people to this. And they saw God's supernatural hand touch a man and many, many, many people came to Christ as a result of what Peter and John did. For Paul and Barnabas, it didn't work out that way. In Jerusalem, the prevailing atmosphere was trust in the true God. In Lystra, the prevailing atmosphere was trust in Zeus and Hermes. And so as soon as they saw a miracle, they interpreted it through their grid. And their grid was, the gods have come down and walked among us, and they are Zeus and Hermes. And they were about to hold a sacrifice, and Paul and Barnabas did everything they could to stop the sacrifice, and with great difficulty, saying, guys, don't do this foolishness, they confronted the, the priests, the religious leaders of, of you know, that area, saying, don't hold this sacrifice, this festival moment. By the way, for the city, it would have been a festival would have been sacrificing oxen, there would have been a lot of meat, a lot of celebration, a lot of food, and now all of a sudden Paul and Barnabas are the killjoys. They're saying, so I mean, it, it's totally away from the guy that was healed to what the priests of Zeus and Hermes were trying to do. And because Paul and Barnabas were finally able to stop it, they ended up being less popular than they should have been. Um, all the way through, we've been seeing Paul and Barnabas run into trials. They've been, they were ejected from Pisidian Antioch. They were ejected um, from Iconium. They were ejected. Now they have this issue with the priests. And, and there is a resistance building. And last week's message I entitled, Pressing Through the Trials 1, which means, and I told you this last week, you already knew the title of today's message last week because it was going to be Pressing Through the Trials 
too. Because it didn't just stop with them having to prevent a sacrifice and becoming negative there. We are told today that even more happened to Paul and Barnabas as a result. Now remember, they had just healed a guy in a super miraculous way. And now, there is a negative turn of events. Verse 19. Then the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. After persuading the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking that he was dead. Now, that's pretty negative. They go from being praised as two gods to being stoned and left for dead. Not a great turn of events. Um, it was because of outside interference. Uh, more than likely, the, the, the crowds were already very disappointed, very embarrassed, very unhappy. They probably felt foolish. Paul and Barnabas had rebuked them over what they were about to do. So these outside voices came in. It was a volatile situation anyway, and they stirred things up against Paul. They won over the crowd. Now remember, I mentioned this last week or the week before, if you are a spiritual leader, and that's who we're talking about here, the spiritual leaders of those synagogues that came down to Lystra, um, if you're a spiritual leader, you want to protect the people that you have charge over. And your goal, and, and of course every spiritual leader does that. When I'm here, if there is something that I need to share um, about spiritually, that there's some new teaching out there that is poison, you're going to share it. You're going to make sure. Here's the difference, though, and this lets you know if you're overstepping your boundaries. See, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Spiritual leaders are not the Holy Spirit. He's actually the one who's in charge of developing and growing your faith and protecting you. He's the one who sanctifies us. Now, he uses spiritual teachers, etc., but we have to walk within our boundaries so we don't step into control. And I used the example last week or the week before that if, if someone in here suddenly said, you know what, I believe there's six or nine people to the Trinity. I'd say change the title of the Trinity then. Okay? But if someone suddenly started teaching that, I would say, hey, listen, you have an opportunity to be able to still sit under my teaching, and I'll hopefully that'll get something, we'll, we'll work together on this, and we'll iron out that thing. But if every service, the person got up and wanted to shout me down and say, there's really nine persons to the Trinity, well, that would be it, okay? That person would have to leave the congregation, because now they're disrupting the services, and it's private property, and there's all sorts of dynamics involved. And we'd say, okay, you just can't come back here anymore because of what you're doing. And so if that person goes out and goes down the way and rents a place, I don't care. I mean, I care in one sense, because I'm going, oh, there's some bad teaching going on. But at the same time, I'm not in charge of his church. I'm not in charge of the people that come to his church. I have a calling from God that I am in charge here. And this is an error that people make all of the time. And Christians do it just the same way that everyone else does often. In fact, just look at the internet. There's people that are going to defend truth all the time and attack people with whom they disagree. Christians attacking fellow Christians because, you know, there's nuances they don't agree with. And that's just not a calling that we have. I don't know of anyone that's called to be an internet apostle meaning that their job is to slander every other Christian on the internet. And by the way, apostles don't do that anyway. But that's just, you know, it's, it's like there's something that gets in us, and it's not healthy, it's a control thing, that makes us think that we have the calling or the authority to go out and fix everything out there. You know, I, I think there's obviously a bit of arrogance to that. because you're assuming that there's nothing to fix in here. I mean, think about it. Uh, when, when John Calvin died, and John Calvin wrote the Institutes, and uh, you know, a lot of the, the Calvinistic theology comes from that, and, and I heard R.C. Sproul tell this story once in a class I was in with him, and uh, he said when John Calvin died, John Calvin said, after he wrote the Institutes, he was a great genius mind. This was back in you know, the 15, 1600s. And, and when John Calvin died, he said, I would, when I get to stand before the Lord, I'll be 
very pleased if I find out that 80% of my institutes are correct. And uh, R.C. Sproul said, I think that John Calvin was a wild optimist. Because of the fact that we are so easily, we misunderstand and we're, it's based upon what, how, the filters that we have on and all sorts of things. But the point is simply this, is our job is to study to show ourselves approved, to be able to share what we know with the people that God has given us charge over, and then not to worry about it. You know, what they do out there is, is I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to do what I can. And I, I don't like it that people are being misled by someone like that, but that's honestly my Job description is it, it, it as a pastor in the community doesn't allow me to go to another city and to begin stirring up crowds against a particular teacher. That's a control spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. And so these guys obviously did that. They they were making that mistake. But again, this is a common mistake. And so they were making that mistake, but they actually believed that what was being taught was like poison to the people. And so they show up and there's, they, 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 they stir up the crowd, they win over the crowd, they convince the crowd that, that uh, Paul and Barnabas are awful, and uh, someone starts stoning them. Someone starts the stoning. Someone starts throwing the stones, and, and for whatever reason, probably because he was the chief spokesman, Paul is the one who gets the rough end of it. And uh, so they uh, assumed he was dead, dragged him outside the city where you threw dead bodies, and that was it. They left him for dead. So Paul is pummeled with stones, and he's left for dead by the people who a few minutes ago, well, probably days, honestly, sometime passed, certainly, but who at a certain point wanted to offer sacrifices to him because he was Hermes. And now they stone him, and they leave him outside the city. So there we go. Paul's outside the city. His missionary journeys appear to be over because they think he's dead. They've accomplished their purpose. And, and maybe they were chagrined. Maybe they didn't want him dead. But it happens when you start throwing stones at people. That can happen. But after the disciples surrounded him, he arose and went into the city. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. They preached the good news in that city and a considerable number of people became disciples. So he's lying there dead. And the people that have already... Um, become disciples in Lystra. And, and, and this, apparently there was some time that passed be between the let's sacrifice to Hermes and, and Zeus and the time that the crowd was won over. Um, and so there were disciples now in that city as well as Barnabas and anyone else that had been traveling with them at that time already. And they end up surrounding him. And here's the picture I want you to think of. Why did they surround him? Because they were shielding him from view. Yeah, that's, I mean, they wanted to make sure no one saw he was alive because guess what they would do? Come out and get him again. Oh, he's still kicking. Let's go. They were afraid of more persecution against Paul. And so they surrounded him. That's very clearly the reason. So now no one can see him. What happens next is just open to speculation. Remember, Luke goes out of his way to say they considered that he was dead, not that he was dead. Luke makes certain we understand he was not dead. But he was injured, and he may have been gravely injured. And so when they surrounded him, uh, one of two things happened. Either Paul had done a very wise thing and early on closed his eyes and pretended to be dead. And if you've got stones being thrown at you, that's not a hard thing to do. Or the people prayed for him and there was a miracle of healing. For whatever, in whatever way, they, prayer, first aid, whatever it was that they did, it resulted in the fact that he was able to stand up, and even the next day he was able to leave the city. Now, I, every once in a while, when you walk through life, you get hit by a stone. You may not not had, had this happen physically. Many of you have had this happen physically. And when you get hit by a stone, it hurts. It hurts bruises. It causes problems. Now imagine getting hit by so many stones that they leave you for dead. That means that there's a lot of damage to your body already because of the number of stones that have been thrown at you. When Paul wrote to the Galatians, that's who these guys are. These are the Galatians. When you think about, hey, what is the letter to Galatia about? It's about Galatia. This is where Paul is right now, in the province of Galatia. When he wrote to the Galatians, including these guys, 
He said, finally, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear the marks of Jesus on my body. Why do you think he said that to the Galatians? Because they knew. They were there. They had seen him after the stoning. They had seen the bruises. They had seen the open wounds. They had seen scar tissue developing. They had seen all of the damage that happened to him already as a result of the fact of the stoning. And so uh, it, was, it was absolutely appropriate for Paul to say to them, by the way, you guys all know when I was over by you, I got stoned. I bear those marks on my body. And so that they'd go, oh yeah, these other super apostles are trying to lead us astray. And Paul paid the price already to get the message to us from the very beginning. So he was uh, very concerned for those that he shepherded. So he gets up, goes into the city, and then uh, ends up going to Derby. And they preach the good news in that city, and a considerable number of people became disciples. And I just want you to pause there. This is about it for Derby. It's like he spent time in Pisidian Antioch. Luke te- develops the story, and he develops the story in Iconium, and he develops the story in Lystra. And if you lived in Derby, this is all you get. But it says that there were many disciples. Many people became disciples. By the way, you only become a disciple through teaching, which means he spent some time there teaching them. And yet, this is not, this is probably a city, I don't know why Luke doesn't spend much time on it. It wasn't as significant a city, but it certainly had a church developing there. And uh, as a result, they ended up, you know, being, Gaius came from Derby. One of Paul's letters, he writes about Gaius from Derby. And so, you know, he, disciples were there and they did the job. But Luke is very quick with this. Nothing out of the ordinary. They went and preached. Lots of people were saved. We're kind of familiar with that story now, aren't we? And so he just moves on. And uh, the only thing that happened in Derby was a lot of new disciples around, and so that's it. By the way, just to remind you of where everything is located, here's our map of Asia Minor and uh, the four locations that we're talking about. Perga, close to the uh, Mediterranean. They landed there when they got into town, or when they, when they came from Cyprus. They got to Perga. doesn't say they preached in Perga, but they went up to Antioch then, to the north there, Pisidian Antioch. Then they went to Iconium over there on the lower right. They went to Lystra. They went to Derby. A town that we'll be introduced to today is Italia, right to the left of Perga, because of the fact that's where the port is, and they'll be headed back to Antioch, and we will see more of that later. Okay, so they return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and telling them, through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of God. Now, that, they, they began retracing their steps. Let me think, if I recall correctly, if they were retracing their steps from Derby, it means they go back to Lystra where they were driven out of town and stoned. And if they go back to uh, Iconium, they were driven out of town by threats of stoning, basically. And if they go back to Pisidian Antioch, there they had been expelled from the area. You know, they're going back to places that they were told they were not, I mean, or, or experienced a great deal of difficulty, and yet now they were only focused on the believers there. They were not doing public meetings, and so they were just going to strengthen the believers as they were retracing their, stress, their steps. Um, I make sure I include the word souls when it speaks in a context such as this. A lot of your translation just said they went back strengthening the disciples. Uh, But it literally says they went back strengthening the souls of the disciples. And the reason I do that is because in the body of Christ, there's often a disagreement about whether we are just body and soul or whether we're just body, soul, and spirit. And and so the idea is the soul must be that spirit thing or whatever. The soul is your mind, emotion, and will. That's very clear. It's an understanding among the Greeks, among everyone who lived in that day and age. The soul was your mind, emotion, and will. And that's why they went strengthening the soul. Now, we, we, are, we are body, we are soul. Our body is the container for our soul here. And we are also spirit. Our spirit is the container for our soul in the heavenly realms. And so as a result, our soul is the key issue of who we are. And uh, our body gives us the ability to interact here. Our soul gives, or I mean, our spirit gives us the ability to interact in the heavenly realms. So 
The, uh, by the way, our spirit is what contains us when we pass from this life. Our body dies, but then we take up, we open up our eyes, and we're with our spirit body in the presence of the Lord. We'll eventually get these bodies back at the resurrection uh, so we can interact here again at the way that we're supposed to. So they went there strengthening them. They encouraged them to continue in the faith. That's interesting. Now remember, it was to the Galatians that he said, I feel as if I have fought this battle for nothing because you have fallen from grace. And we're saved by grace through faith. They have fallen from the grace principle. They began to fall back into the concept of I need to, to, to uh, keep the old covenant to find God's blessing. And they, Paul and Barnabas point out, what well, Paul does when he writes in Galatians, did God do miracles among you because you kept the old covenant? Or because you believed, because you had faith? And so that's the whole point. The, the major attack which they were experiencing was from people who were telling them, hey, you need to keep aspects of the old covenant in order to find God's blessing. If Paul and Barnabas had said to all the new believers, you have to get circumcised and follow some of the more important Jewish holidays, they never would have been persecuted. But it would have been a lie. And Paul stood firm against anything like that. He said, that's not what the new covenant is. The new covenant is that Jesus Christ paid the price so that we might have forgiveness. And Jesus Christ paid the price so that not only might we have forgiveness, but we might be able to walk into the blessing of the covenant that we've been given. We might be able to walk in the blessing that is promised for the old covenant. And we might be able to walk in the blessing and the promises of the kingdom. That's what Jesus did. He paid the price. And so through faith, that's why he says, continue in the faith. Paul already understood that this was going to be a major battleground throughout Galatia. It's still a major battleground today. And I've spent the, uh, some, a, a bit of time in each of the last couple of messages simply pointing out it's still that major battleground. People always want you to add something. Do you want divine health? Great. Pray for it. Trust Christ. And then eat my special formula that I found. It's just the way it is. And, you know, if you want to, I know of whole segments of South Florida, and I hope it's not this way anymore, that they'll simply say, hey, you're sinning against your body if you eat pork. Now, I personally don't have a problem with other people who believe this because it's more bacon for me. Just in case there's a bacon shortage. That's Old Covenant. That's Old Covenant, as, as, as pure as you can be, that's Old Covenant. And so, whether you eat pork or not is, means nothing to whether or not you have divine favor in your life. But it's one of the ways that people work, and they do things, and they, they add, and trust Christ, and then listen to God for your personal dietary needs. You know, trust Christ. And say, Lord, and if there's any wisdom that I need to have in how I eat the food that I eat or how I respond to the things that I eat, give it to me. But don't absolutize your moto spheres, which means don't make your deal everyone else's deal. Don't don't make it into something that is, you know, this is the way God spoke to me about how I'm supposed to steward my body. And so now you all got to do the same thing. Think about what Jesus said. John the Baptist came and his deal was fasting. And abstinence. Jesus came and his deal was being able to partake. And they called him a glutton and a drunkard. They called John demon-possessed. Because they wanted to absolute, they wanted to make their deal everyone's deal. And they didn't like what John did because that was too severe. And they didn't like what Jesus did because in their minds that was too lax. And so they wanted everyone to do what they did. And that's, that's a trap that we can fall into. Let God speak to people. I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit does work in us all. Trust that God's going to speak. You might walk away rolling your eyes, saying to yourself, yeah, the pizza diet sounds a little bit excessive. Sounds delicious. Sounds delicious. <laughs> so anyway, continuing in the faith, we have, to, we have to fight for that all the time. And trust that God will guide us personally or individually about what we need. So... Continuing in the faith, they said, make sure you're continuing in the faith. And then they said this famous phrase, through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I'm sure that that phrase came up because Paul looked a mess. 
He bore in his body the marks of Jesus. He had been stoned. That's a difficult thing. And so um, they, he's talking about entering the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom is to, it's the full measure of the reign, reign of Christ in your lives. That's one quick, short definition. It's the reign of Christ in, in, on earth as it is in heaven. And our whole goal is to manifest the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where Satan's works are turned upside down. Where the evil and the death and the sickness and everything else that is satanic, the lack of love, the the lack of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, where those things are all turned upside down and we release the positive life of Jesus Christ. And we are, we are releasing the love, the joy, the peace, all those things into the area that we are, but also the supernatural presence of Jesus and his life. The, the kingdom was being manifested in Lystra when that man jumped up off the ground. The kingdom was being manifested when Paul and Barnabas said, hey, we're just men like you. They were speaking the truth of God. We're just men like you are. The kingdom was being manifested when Paul and Barnabas kept on going and in perseverance pressed through the problems of their lives. Whenever you press through the problem of your life, the problems that you will encounter, the kingdom of God is manifesting in your life. We're overcomers. We're not victims. We're overcomers. And we will always persevere and press through the problems which come because they're a chance for us to overcome as we go. So entering the kingdom, he says it's through much tribulation. That one is one, you know... (laughs) That one is one that you don't have to wear as a badge, but it's a reality you should remember every time you have a problem that happens in your life. See, there's an enemy in this world who hates my guts because I love Jesus. And so they're going to work hard. Now, you need to learn, how, you need to learn spiritual warfare. It means praying for you and yourself and your family. That's spiritual warfare. You need to learn the wisdom about how to handle yourself and your family and live for Jesus. And, and you need to know how to manifest the kingdom in your life more and more. That's what we do as Christians. That's called discipleship. You know, we, we learn about what it is that allows us to overcome in our lives and to persevere and to have faith. We look at the promises of God. We hold on to them. And as we get through them, it's, you know, Paul was just very clear. We don't, most of us have to be stoned. We don't have to be pummeled with stones, pelted with stones. We don't have to be stoned any other way either. Yeah, thank God. That's an illegal, that's an illegal. Um, That's probably, by the way, how Balaam, generally speaking, got into the presence of God because he was a soothsayer. He was a you know, when you think about what did Balaam do to get into the presence of God? How did he, he, he lowered the veil with using drugs. That's what? happens. It's an illegal way to get into the presence of God, and often you will be inviting in other spirits besides God. So, a bad idea. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five to 27, when he was talking to them about the type of tribulation that he had experienced. He says, three times I was beaten with switches. Once I was stoned. I was shipwrecked three times. I was adrift in the sea for a night and a day. I've been on journeys often. Back then, journeys were dangerous and not as convenient as our journeys. I have experienced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in cities, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, and dangers from false brothers. I have experienced labor and trouble, often gone without sleep, living with hunger and thirst, fasting often, and living with cold nakedness. Don't you want to become an apostle? It's like, you know... Just a couple of these things would be like a very difficult thing that people have to face and overcome and deal with. And he's like, this is just yeah, a normal day. And you're like, yes. So, and he's pointing out to them, you know, the credentials of his apostleship by talking about this sort of stuff. You're going, yeah, okay, boy, glad that that's not something that, you know, we all have to go through at that high level. So, um, Through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom. So, what did they do as they went to those cities again, retracing their steps? It says, they appointed elders for them in each church. And after they prayed with fasting, they presented them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So now they're going back to all those congregations that 
founded, and now they're making sure they get a leadership structure in place. I've already said for them, it was probably pretty easy to, because they started in the synagogues, and then they were able to um, you know, spot who in the synagogues were able to be. Maybe there were already leaders in the synagogue that got saved, and now they would be the natural church leaders. Um, whatever way it was, the Holy Spirit was guiding them as they were appointing these elders. By the way, the word appoint, if you read any commentaries, um, is a word that before this had come out of the Greek uh, mindset or setting um, with the idea of elect by the show of hands. However, here it's clear and it had morphed along the way uh, into if you appointed someone, that was also, you could use this word for, uh, I have no doubt that they got the agreement of the congregation for everyone they selected. So they actually may have held a vote and said, is this okay, is this the person? Because the people that knew the person the most were those who lived in the area. It says prayer with fasting. I, that's, that's exactly what the Greek language says. Prayer with fasting. I didn't do the common thing, prayer and fasting, because I wanted to make the expression different. It's not, sometimes we say, oh, they did this with prayer and fasting. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. It's prayer and fasting. It means they fasted for three days. No, no. They prayed and they fasted. Prayer with fasting. They prayed, and while they prayed, they fasted. They may have fasted a little bit before. They may have fasted a little bit after. But at least to me, it spells it out a little bit more specifically what type of fasting they were doing because there were different ways that they fasted in, the, uh, in, in that era, in the New Testament era. And then what they did is they presented them to the Lord. And the Lord is the one who's going to have to keep their souls and the Holy Spirit's going to have to work with them and help develop them so that they're the leaders that they're supposed to be in that area. Verses 24, 20 through 26. When they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. When, when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. I told you that would show up. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been delivered over to the grace of God for the work they had completed. So they got done now. They were done. They appointed the elders, and their missionary journey, their first one, was done. And so they headed back, but as they went back, they were preaching. And they had not, we are not told they preached in Perga when they first went there. However, this time in Perga, they preached as they were there. It says they, uh, they uh, went through, uh, where was, oh, in the beginning verse, they passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Here's the provinces. There's Galatia, by the way. And if you look in Galatia, there is uh, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe are all over by that Laconia area there. Antioch is actually in Phrygia, but they called it Pisidian Antioch because there was another Antioch in Phrygia, and so they, this was the Antioch which was close to Pisidia. So they, went, they were in Derby in the southeast. They went back up to Lystra. They went back up to Iconium. They went up to Antioch in the west, and then they went south again to Perga, which is now covered by the name Pamphylia, and uh, they ended up going to... Italia on the coast, because from there they sailed all the way over on the right lower side there uh, to uh, Antioch. And, and first they ended up, the port city was Seleucia, then they went up to Antioch. And so they were preaching as they went. Some of you like maps, and so I make sure that every once in a while, especially when they're mentioning city names, let you know where they are. Um, and it says that they, uh, they had been delivered over to the grace of God from Antioch. That's exactly what happened, and that's what they did with the elders. They delivered the elders over to the grace of God so that now the elders would be able to do their job. They quit controlling the elders. They would write letters of instruction or whatever, but they said, You're, you and God are now in charge. And, you know, with the congregation, whatever structure of leadership that they intended to do as a congregation, the Bible's really loose about New Testament structure because the Holy Spirit will lead each congregation in the way that it needs to be led. Again, it's just like when we're trying to make people, you know, do what God has shown us about our diets or the way we stewards our bodies. It's the same way in Christian congregations. We want everyone to have our government structure. We want everyone to be the same way. We are. What if that doesn't work for certain cultures, certain subsets of people, certain geographical locations? We got to let them do. You know, we, we, there's a congregation. 
We have presented them to the Lord. We have delivered them over to the grace of God. Obviously, the congregation delivered them over to the grace of God a year earlier and had no more ability to communicate with them. We've got way too much ability to communicate now. We could control someone from the moment they left to the moment they came back. We just keep them under text messages or FaceTime. Or, okay, and, and sometimes the missionaries on the site are going to find out at a much higher level what really is needed than home base, which is trying to control what they're doing. I mean, again, I could get into topics I won't. Okay. When they had arrived and gathered the church, they reported everything that God had done, not down, had done through them, and that it, he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. They remained with the disciples for quite some time time so they gathered the church to report everything that god had done this is if you ever support a missionary in your church every once in a while the missionaries show up and say let me tell you what it is that god has done we had this year the one of the missionaries that we support in turkey uh, show up but it was during the covid times and he just didn't feel comfortable coming to speak to our congregation also, um, because we do video streaming, it would not necessarily be wise for him to appear on a video that was going up onto the internet because of the, you know, the situation that's going on right there. Um, so they, they started to share what God had done through them. Now, think about that. We go out on the missions we have been given by the Holy Spirit that Jesus has directed the Holy Spirit to give to us but it's God who accomplishes the work. This is 1 Corinthians 12. The Holy Spirit gives us the gifts, Jesus gives us the ministry opportunity, and the Father accomplishes the work. That's how the Trinity works in our callings. The Father accomplishes the supernatural energy that is released in us. The, Jesus is the one who provides the ministry opportunity, and the Holy Spirit gives us the gifts, the anointing, and all of that. And so they have been using the gifts that they've been given by the Holy Spirit, the ministry opportunities they've been given by Jesus, and the power that the Father has released to them. And they recognize that none of those three things is them. They just aim their feet in a certain direction and used their spiritual gifts as they went. They were faithful to their calling and trusted that God would meet them. And that really speaks to us. You, you, you get faithful to your calling. You trust that God's going to meet you. The Holy Spirit's the one who's going to be able to give you the gifts. Jesus, the ministry opportunities. Father's going to energize it. And you get done, you go, wow, that really worked out well. All I did was show up. And God made all these things happen. You prepared, you, you know, but all of that is the Lord helping, anointing, carrying forward. So they were able to share what God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. I like that, opening the door of faith. It's like the Gentiles, their hearts were closed off and suddenly the door was open. I like to say it's taking the blinders off. You know, God takes the blinders off and you see how good he looks. And you say, I want that because he took the blinders off. If he opens the door, the light of his glory shines through. And all the Gentiles that were happy with their false gods go, there's something different over there. And they start walking through that door. Okay, that's, these are very picturesque metaphors that they are using. And, but it makes sense to us because it happened to us. If you got saved as an adult, that's the way you got saved. You, what you heard about Christ was far better than anything that you had heard before. You said, I want that. that. The blinders were kicked off. The door was open. You saw something that provided life. If you were saved as a kid, eh, there may be times that you had recommitments and stuff, and that same type of thing became evident to you along the way. But in whatever case, this is the way it works. The Holy Spirit is making sure that we can see that Christ is most excellent above everything else. So we have to press through the trials. That's, you know, Two messages on pressing through the trials. Through much tribulation, we enter into the kingdom of God. Nothing that comes upon us in the world in which we live today is outside the realm of what God can use or allow us to overcome. Nothing. And that is something that we have to hold on to with the fullness of faith. After a year of just difficulty, they got back and were able to say, wow, look what God did. They didn't focus on the pain. 
The only time Paul's focused on the pain was when he needed to, to be able to like say, guys, you are ignoring how God has used me in the past. You have, you have forgotten. There are people out there that want to be super apostles. Let me tell you what it's like to be an apostle. That's that list in Corinthians. <laughs> you know, I want to let you know what it's really like. Um, and, and so that's the only time we heard about those things or when Luke was reporting it. Otherwise, they didn't come back and say, yeah, all these bad things happened to us. They came back and said, look what God has done. Because all the pain just fades away because of what they could see God was birthing around them. Well, Lord, I ask that that would be the same in our lives. Father, today, thank you for this great grace that you have given us to be able to look at this story of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, which reminds us of what it is like to walk, aiming at the kingdom. I ask that you would help us to be able to step into that in our own lives, no matter what challenge is facing us right now. I ask that you help us to overcome those challenges and to step forward fully in your kingdom. Give us the grace, give us the understanding, give us the per- per- perseverance, and help us to see the hope you're releasing to us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.